In this lecture, we'll discuss matching and weighting methods, which are um, primary tools for analyzing observational data. So, as we have been studying, the causal inference is the inference about the counterfactuals or potential outcomes. It's a comparison between two and control units that allow us to estimate these counterfactuals. Let's consider the average treatment effect for the treated. One uh, method we have looked at is the use of regression. So use, regression is basically a way to use the model to impute the missing potential outcomes. So for the treated units, we are missing y of zero. So we can use the regression, highlight with the red um, font, to compute, um, you know, impute the uh, missing potential outcome y of zero. So in this case, uh, if it's a linear regression, for example, you might uh, just use the x times beta hat as a way to impute the uh, mean of potential outcomes for, for each particular observation. Okay, so the pro problem of this approach is that regression can be model dependent just by, by definition. And so if the model is incorrect, um, then the estimates, the resulting estimates may be sensitive to um, the, the, the misspecification, model misspecification. So what we're going to discuss uh, in this lecture is the method, uh, class of methods called matching, which essentially is a non-parametric uh, way of imputing the potential outcomes. So it's, we are still imputing the potential outcomes, but we are basically taking the average of match set. So um, CARI MI is a set of control observations that is matched to treated unit I. Okay. So, and then we take an average of observed outcome for those matched control units as a, our imputed um, potential outcome for, for each treated unit. Okay. So that's, it's a basic, um, it's a very uh, simple idea of finding the control units that look like uh, each treated unit and then use the mean of that um, control units as a way to estimate the potential outcome, missing potential outcome y of zero for a treated unit. And we'll also discuss weighting, which is essentially a generalization of matching. Okay, first, just sort of let's get the intuition uh, established. So we can think of matching as a non-parametric pre-processing for reducing the model dependence. The idea is that matching allows you to select a set of control units that look like a treated units. Okay? By making the treatment group and control group similar to each other with respect to the observed covariates, uh, we can reduce the model dependence. So you can think of this matching as a pre-processing step where you make the treated and control groups similar to each other. And then after making, uh, after that step, uh, you may be able to, um, you could use the regression or any other kind of models to estimate the uh, um, causal effects, okay? So in this uh, slide, you see two figures, before matching on the left and after matching on the right, okay? T represents the treated unit, C represents the control unit. Um, the, for illustration, there's only one covariate x on the uh, horizontal axis, and then the outcome is um, plotted on the y-axis. Okay. Here we're going to use uh, two types of models, linear models and a quadratic model, uh, separately fit for the treated and control group. So the gap between these two lines represents um, the treatment effect. So on the left, uh, before matching, you see that uh, there are some extreme values. Large x and small x has lots of control units, but there's no treated units there. Okay, so the treat control units are spread across the entire range of x, whereas the treated units are concentrated in the middle. In this situation, what you see is that linear regression, if you just fit the linear regression, the treated group line is above the control group line which means that there is a positive effect of the treatment, treatment impact. However, if you fit the quadratic model, uh, which is the dashed line, you see that the treated line is below the control line, 
control group line, which means that um, it would uh, imply that the treatment effect is estimated to be negative. Okay, so two different models give you a completely different answer. On the right, after matching, basically we end up dropping all these uh, control units that have large or very large or very small value of x because there's no other, no treated unit that are similar to them. So some, sometimes we can think of matching as pruning, pruning observations. So once we do that, whatever, whether you use the linear model or quadratic model doesn't really matter. Both um, models give you the estimate of no effect. Okay. So in this way, the matching really reduces uh, model dependence. The, the, the goal of the matching is to make a treatment, treatment group and control group similar uh, such that um, the, the estimates are less model dependent. And the same essential goal applies to the weighting as well. Now let's consider bias in observational studies and to see uh, what aspects of the bias, the matching and the weighting methods can address. Uh, let's recall there are two assumptions that we often make in observational studies. The first one is the overall, that is every unit um, uh, legal rest of their covariate values have non-zero probability of receiving the treatment and belonging to the control group. And the second uh, assumption is the ignorability or unconfoundedness, which states that condition on X, uh, treatment is independent of potential outcomes. Okay. Under these, um, so those are the assumptions we make. We can now look at the bias decomposition. Okay, so that here, since we are estimating average treatment effect for the treated, what we would like to infer is the um, expected value of y of zero, the counterfactual outcome among the treated t equal one. Okay. Suppose you're going to use the mean of um, control group uh, t equal zero as a way to estimate it. So the difference between these two quantities represents the bias. Okay, so the observed outcome, mean of observed outcome among the control is used to estimate the mean of potential outcome y of zero among the treated. Okay. So this bias has three terms. Uh, each term, the expression is a little bit complicated, uh, but the interpretation, it has a nice interpretation. Okay. So the first term uh, represents bias due to lack of common support. And here, um, let me explain the notation that S represents the common support. So this is a support of the distribution of X, which uh, is common to both treatment group and the control group. Okay. S1 is a support uh, for the treatment group, support of the X uh, for the treatment group, and S0 is a support of um, X for the control group. So, so this difference is be basically between the quantity that's outside of the common support because the S1 set minus S is the support of S1, uh, support of X, you know, among the treatment uh, group that is not part of the common support. And that's sim similarly for the control group. Okay. So this is basically the uh, bias due to um, extrapolation. So in the previous figure that um, if the treatment group and control group distribution have very different um, lack of common support, uh, then the bias could arise from that. So that's um, the one source of bias is due to the lack of common support, the distribution not of, of X not overlapping with, with one another. Okay? The second part is the bias due to imbalance of observables. Uh, X uh, within their common support. So this is where if there's any differences um, uh, within the common support in terms of distribution of X between the treated and control. Okay. So you can see that it uh, comes down to the conditional distribution of X given T, how that's different between T equal one and T equal zero. F, F represents the conditional distribution. The third term is bias due to unobservables in common support of observables. Okay. So you can see that the highlighted part of the equation represents the conditional expectation of y of zero between the treated group and the control group difference, conditional x, okay, 
So those two terms are different if there is unobservables that's, um, that's uh, affecting the outcome. So there's basically three terms of bias, and the matching and weighting, similarly, deal with one and two, right? So we can focus on the common support by dropping some of the observation that's we've done in the previous slide. We can address some issues, uh, some of the bias due to lack of common support uh, by restricting our attention to the common support of observed uh, variables. And we can also make the treatment group and control group similar within their common support. So we can also address the second source of bias that may exist in observational studies. However, the third source of bias, which is unobservables, we are not able to deal with because uh, you know, obviously we don't observe that. So by making the treatment group and control groups similar with respect to observables, doesn't necessarily mean that they're also similar and observables. You know, we would hope that's the case, but that's not, that's not guaranteed. Okay. So it's very important to um, remember that the matching and weighting only deals with these two sources of bias instead of this third source. So let's think about the basic uh, matching uh, methods. And the most basic one is the exact matching, right? So you can find the uh, control unit that looks exactly the same as each treatment group. Okay, exact same value of all x variables. In this case, the empirical distribution of x given t, it's going to be the same between t equal 1 and t equal 0. Okay, so the perfect covariant balance. That means that no model dependence, right, because those two um, uh, groups have the same exact distribution of x, there's no need to control for the, um, there's no need to control for the uh, x variables uh, once you do the exact match. And even if you do, you're going to get the same exact answer all the time. But of course, the exact matching is infeasible uh, when covariate is continuous. And there may, there may be many, too many covariates, and you cannot find someone who looks exactly like the uh, particular treated unit. So this method only works in a very small, uh, low dimension with um, discrete variables, with small number of categories. Okay. So the natural next step is uh, something called coerce and exact match. So we can still do exact match if we discretize covariates um, discretize, say, continuous covariates, and collapse some categories of um, categorical variables. Okay? And so, um, so basically, like, coerce in the categories, coerce in the uh, continuous variables, such that we can still do the exact matching on this coerce and version of the variables. Um, this method uh, is quite popular because, you know, covariates in especially social sciences are often discrete. Um, if you're dealing with survey data, for example, a lot of discrete variables, um, maybe the only thing that's truly continuous is that the age, even then it's, you can put in the age categories. And the discrete categories may also have substantive meanings. So instead of using a year of education, you could say high school graduate and college graduate or college dropout. So there might be a substantively meaning for discrete categories, uh, even for Sort of continuous type of variables. What's nice about that, uh, it still has uh, some features of exact matching. So in the in this coercion version of the variables, it accounts for all interactions um, and any uh, type of higher order um, um, effects. Uh, some treated units uh, may have no match control if when you do this type of uh, matching and because there's a lack of overlap, in that case, you end up changing the estimate because you're going to drop the treated units that doesn't have exact match, even on this course in the variables. Then the original treatment group may be very different from the treatment group you end up analyzing. In that case, you're, what you're estimating is not for the average treatment effect for the treated, for the original treated, but this limited um, group of treated units, for whom you can find control units, similar control units. 
So obviously there is a bias variance trade off here. Like if you make the categories, uh, this um, category is very fine, then you start losing a lot of observations. If you make the ca category um, big, you know, just a dichotomized say continuous treatment instead of dividing it into say five categories, then you're gonna retain more observations but you may end up introducing the bias. So the, this bias variance trade-off is inherent in the matching uh, the weighting methodology. And it may still be infeasible in high dimensions. So once you have 10, 20 variables, or maybe even more, this type of approach becomes, uh, becomes very difficult to implement. To, do, to deal with this issue, um, we can try to sort of reduce uh, dimension of covariates. Okay, so if you have many covariates to match on, you might uh, come up with some distance measures so that instead of matching on every single variable separately, we can match on these distance measures. So I'm gonna introduce two common measures that's being used. One is something called Maharanovic distance. So here I define the distance between a unit i and a unit j, which has the values of x uh, as x, xi and xj, using basically the covariance adjusted. So the uh, sigma tilde is an estimated covariance of x, and so it's basically square distance uh, divided by the covariance. Okay, so it's a standardized distance on the multivariate scale. Uh, so xi and xj is a vector. Um, so it's, it's, it's standardized distance measure um, of, of, you know, multivariate standardized distance measure. Uh, we can also uh, use something called the propensity score, which is um, typically estimated. So it'd be estimated propensity score. Propensity score is a probability of receiving the treatment conditional on X. Okay, so it's a conditional probability of treatment assignment given x is the propensity score. Basically, it tells you how likely you are to receive the treatment, and you can compute this for every observation and compute the, say, absolute difference between the two. Uh, oftentimes, if you use a logistic regression, you use the linear predictor instead of the probabilities uh, to compute the distance. So once we have these distances, we can do a variety of sort of classical matching methods. And I'm not going to um, review all of this. There are lots of choices. So for example, you can mix and match the distance-based matching with exact matching. For example, I can do distance-based matching within the men, women separately, in which case I'm basically exactly matching on the gender and while using um, distance measure to control for the other differences. Um, you can do one-to-one -one matching, one-to-many matching. You can do matching with or without replacement. Obviously, without replacement, you will uh, have a better balance, but you may increase the variance because you end up using the same observation multiple times. And you can also use something called caliper, which is to ensure that um, you never match two observations uh, with, with very different values on, on a particular variable, for example, or a particular distance. Okay? So you might impose a restriction that I will never match two observations that has potential score distance of, say, 0.1. Okay? So these are uh, different options. You can mix and match uh, when implementing matching method. In general, uh, if you're going to use this type of classical matching methods, my recommendation is typically that identi first identify a small number of very important variables uh, using your substantive knowledge, and then match those on those variables really well, either using exact matching or coercion exact matching. And then the rest of the variables that you um, may suspect that are also confounders, you can use some of these distance-based measures uh, computing on those variables to um, additional to do have additional control. So whether it's a Mahalovis distance or a propensity score distance.